Chris Webster here, co-founder of the APN. I just wanted to thank you for supporting archaeological education and outreach. Please share this post across your socials so more can learn about our shared past. On to the episode. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 27 of the Life in Ruins podcast, where we investigate the careers of those living life in ruins. I'm your host, Carlton Gover, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Connor John and David Ann Howe. Our guest tonight is the Dr. Robert L. Kelly, who is a professor of anthropology at the University of Wyoming. Dr. Kelly, it is extremely awesome to have you on the podcast. Dr. Kelly was both mine and Connor's master thesis advisors and was on David's um, thesis committee. So this is the guy that really taught us how to be grad students and professional academics. So we're kind of nervous to have him on, but we're really excited at the same time. So how are you doing on this wonderful July 5th, Dr. Kelly? I'm doing great. Good. And you're in Laramie right now? I'm in Laramie right now. Very quiet here. I don't think I've ever been there that long during the summer. Probably like a day or two here and there. This is probably the most time I've ever spent in uh, Laramie in the summer. I'm usually out out in the field someplace. Yeah. Is that odd for you this year? I'm sure it is. It's extremely odd for for me. It doesn't feel right. I, I, I Sometimes I just want to go out and sleep in the back of my pickup truck in the driveway just to make myself feel feel better. <laughs> and it's especially odd because, you know, I was in Germany on a Humboldt fellowship last summer. So I didn't do field work last summer. And I believe this is the first time since 1973 that I've not done field work two summers in a, in a row. Wow. And that's, it's not a good feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine that is definitely an interesting feeling, if anything. But <laughs> So you said since 1973? Yes. I guess what kind of got you started in 1973, if you want to take us that way? I can't remember a time when I didn't want to be an archaeologist, which is a little strange. Uh, but ever since I was very young, I, I was just interested in uh, the outdoors. I was interested in living off the land. I was interested in Native American culture. I was interested in in history and the past. And uh, I suppose all of those interests kind of converge on archaeology. I also just enjoyed being out by myself and walking through the farmer's cornfields uh, looking for uh, arrowheads, which I did quite a a bit. And then I I had this, this interest and when I was in high school, when I was 16 in high school, uh, one of the teachers brought this pamphlet to me for an organization that was called Educational Expeditions International. Today, it's known as Earthwatch. And uh, he said, y- you might ap- apply to this. They, they give scholarships for high school students to go work with scientists, field scientists, uh, including archaeologists, during the summer. So I applied for it. And I, I got one, and I didn't have any choice on where they sent me. They they simply just told me, you know, you're going to go out to Nevada from my home in uh, Connecticut, and uh, there, there's a project out there, and you're going to work on that project. Uh, there was the Gate Cliff Rock Shelter uh, excavation run by David Hurst Thomas. So I went out there for several weeks when I was 16 and got to know David and um, – you know, like they say, the rest is history. So going from Connecticut to Nevada, was that a big change? I mean, what was your first impression of the West when you when you first made it out here? Well, it, it actually wasn't my first experience. My first experience was the summer before that in 72. I was a Boy Scout and I went to uh, Philmont Ranch in northern New, New Mexico and spent 10 days doing a, I don't know, it was a 50, 60 mile uh, hike there through the Philmont Scout Scout Ranch. That, that's probably when I said, I, I have to live in the West. I, I was born in the wrong place. I need to be in the desert. I need to be near, near mountains. So I was actually really thrilled when it turned out the excavation I was going to go on was in Nevada. 
because it was out out west and that's that's where I wanted to be. So it wasn't my first experience in the in the west. But it, it was nonetheless an, an an interesting experience because the the first day that I was there in the in the camp we 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 get up and the task I was assigned was to go work on the survey team. I wasn't out at the excavation. I did eventually work at the excavation, of course. But the first day was to go out and work on the regional survey that David was doing with the, the project. And that was run by uh, Robert Bettinger, who was a brand new PhD at the, at the time. So we went out and did survey that first day. And I'm going to make a very long story short here, but we ended up getting stuck in the truck and uh, spent the night out. It was about uh, seven of us who sp- spent the night out in this pickup truck. Oh, no. <laughs> and the next the next morning, Dave Thomas found us by he, he, he convinced a local rancher to fly out to look for us in his little two seater uh, air- airplane. And this this fellow just landed the airplane in the middle of the desert, came over, and he and David helped push us out of the the ditch that we were stuck stuck in. Uh, I think that's when I learned that you never never take a two wheel drive pickup into the into the desert. Oh my goodness! But that was my that was my first day of archaeology. Was we got stuck and spent the night out sleeping in the dirt next to the truck. Uh, <laughs> I, I I thought it was great fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I can imagine. How uh, how many summers did you spend at um, Gate Cliff, Dr. Kelly? Oh, after the summer of seventy three, I asked David if I could come back, not not through uh, Earthwatch, but just just as a volunteer, and uh, and he said I could, and so I went back to Gate Cliff in seventy four, seventy five, seventy six. By 76, he, he put me in charge of another excavation, the excavation of another rock shelter. In 77, I worked with David in southern Nevada doing a survey around Pleistocene lake shores. By 78, I worked with Bettinger in California and a little bit at Gatecliff. That was the last season of excavation at uh, Gatecliff. And in 79, I worked with David at the excavation of uh, Hidden Cave in western Nevada. And then uh, in 80 and 81, I was doing my own dissertation field work uh, outside Fallon, Nevada. So I just kept, I just, I just kept working with David. And you guys know that now Dave and I uh, co-author textbooks together. So it, it, it was probably the second best piece of luck I, I, I had in my life. That's that's super cool that you guys have maintained that relationship um, professionally and it's, you know, really worked together with that. So for the folks who may not know much about Gatecliff, do you mind explaining, you know, what's so cool about this site? Oh, uh, Gatecliff, it it was a a wonderful site to have your first experience on, although also a, a terrible place to have your first experience, a terrible place because... I, I thought, well, this is this is what archaeological sites are like, and everyone I'm going, every place I dig is going to be like this one, and <laughs> Gatecliff is absolutely, utterly unique. It was enormously deep. The site was, you know, well over uh, forty feet deep by the time the excavation was was done. Although lo- the lowest deposits are, are not even ten thousand years years old, and the the reason it's so it's so deep, and the and the reason that makes it so unique is that it's a rock shelter in a canyon, and out in front of it is a very small stream. If you saw it today, you would wonder how could this stream do this, <laughs> but occasionally that stream would apparently get dammed, and it, it, the the water would back up and fill into the shelter, and when it filled into the shelter, it carried some sediments in with it, but then a lot of very fine windblown sediment would get blown into the water and would settle out into the rock rock shelter. And it, it formed these layers. Sometimes they were like a meter thick of these very beautiful, clean, white layers of fine grain silt 
which separated these living floors because eventually that dam, whatever was damming up the, the canyon broke, the little pond in Gay Cliff drained, and then people came in and occupied this, this surface, which it must have been a surface like linoleum, just this flat floor. And they did, did things there and left things behind and made hearths and left. And then it happened again. The, the dam form, the site gets flooded, this thick layer of silt gets deposited, then the dam breaks, the water drains out, people come in and use it again. It's, it's remarkable. This happened over and over and over again throughout uh, much of the site's prehistory. It, it's literally layer cake stratigraphy with these big, you know, white vanilla layers of cake with what looks like, you know, chocolate icing in between them. And that's the living surfaces with charcoal and animal bone on them. So, so you had these beautiful living sur surfaces that were extremely well preserved. I've never seen another site anywhere in the world like it. And that's, that's what makes that site, that particular site, so unique. As, as I was your TA um, for Intro to Archaeology, I think my first semester at Wyoming, and, I, and Gate Cliff is in your book, Introduction to Archaeology, 7th edition by you and Dr. David Hurst Thomas. It's just a phenomenal site to really learn about stratigraphy or teach people about strat uh, stratigraphy. And then also it was kind of nice to have that background because that's also, um, you know, Dr. Douglas Fanforth also worked at Gate Cliff. I think not, not as long as you did. Um, but that's we use right. that same site right. to teach stratigraphy to our students. So having your background behind it, and then also Dr. Bamforth's, because we don't use your guys' textbook, unfortunately. We use something else, which I completely and utterly hate. So we have to bring in all the gate cliff stuff uh, additionally. But that's, you know, if we're teaching intro students about stratigraphy and living surfaces and um, multiple occupations, it's just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal, but don't don't expect this, the next site you excavate is going to look like that because it won't. <laughs> it's like a, so it's a yeah. it's it's like the archaeologist's yeah. ideal site that occurs once <laughs> once a yeah. state. I don't know, yeah. you know, something like that. Yeah, I think well, Om. I mean, Om was definitely nowhere. Om Rock Shelter um, was nowhere near as deep in terms of like multiple occupations. Like I kind of got, I felt like I got that kind of that same kind of feel working there because now the site I work at now it's like single occupation one living surface we really don't dig too deep it's just mostly horizontal excavation but I kind of miss those Wyoming days of just like digging in from archaic down to down to Clovis levels because that was that was pretty fun yeah yeah that's an interesting site it, it has its own uh, utility and we're we're working on the analysis of that one now not a doctor yet. Yeah, we just had him on the last episode. And he was telling us more about the OM analysis. So it's really nice that, um, so for our listeners to know what we're talking about, just go back one episode and listen to Alex Crabe's little spiel on what he's doing for um, Dr. Kelly, who is his uh, PhD dissertation advisor. So it's kind of not nice to have you guys back to back. So when you were a high school student, you were, got the amazing opportunity to work at Gate Clip. So where, where did you go for um, your undergraduate to pursue a degree in archaeology? Well, for, for undergraduate, I went to Cornell U University. That's not where I wanted to go. I wanted to go to the University of Col Colorado. You didn't want to go to the top school in the Ivy League? Uh, no. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to be in the West. Oh, uh, right. And University of Colorado had a, a good re reputation, and it was in the West, too, and it was in the mountains. So that's, that's where I really wanted to go. Uh, and my parents asked me to stay closer to home. So I I agreed to that. You did get to see a lecture by Carl Sagan. I remember you telling me that, though. Well, Carl Sagan was uh, a professor at, at Corn Cornell. He was in the audience for a, a lecture about um, oh, the, right. the med medicine wheel. Ba basically, he, he said, you know, there's a great statistically, a, 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 a very high likelihood statistically that some spokes on the wheel are going to line up with some interesting astronomical phenomena. So he basically said to the speaker, you know, there's no reason to believe anything you just told us. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, he was not Carl Sagan. He, he was not Carl Sagan at the time. He, he was just a very well-regarded professor. Gotcha. Okay. 
uh, he had he had not gone on to TV by that by that that time. So I, I went to Cornell. It was very useful. It's a very good school, of course, and it gave me an opportunity to go spend a semester in uh, South America in northern Chile, where we excavated some uh, sites, the kinds of things I've never worked on since, including uh, an uh, Inca site. So that was all very, very useful for me. That experience shows up in my textbook, and it shows up in a lot of my lectures. So I, I wasn't completely unhappy with that, but yeah, I still wish that I had gone to Boulder <laughs> instead. And then once I got done at Cornell, I went west. I, I had applied for the University of Michigan, uh, which is where I wanted to go because it was the top uh, graduate school at the time. I didn't get in the first time I applied, so I ended up at the University of New Mexico, where I worked with Lou, Lou Binford, which, of course, was a, a fantastic experience. It really helped strongly shape the kind of archaeologist that uh, I am to, today. Uh, I got my master's from there, and then uh, I had reapplied to Michigan, and I got in the second time that I applied, so I transferred there for my PhD, uh, which was okay. a great experience at Michigan. Uh, I learned a great deal, but I'd still say that b between Dave Thomas and Lewis Binford, those th those are two of the major influences uh, on on my career, on on how I approach uh, archaeology. Yeah, thank thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for ex explaining that. We'd love to you know talk to you more about Lou Binford, um, ask you some questions about him, but we're going to do that in the next segment over. So that's the end of uh, segment one, of our interview with Dr. Robert Kelly. Just catch you on the flip side. Chris Webster here to tell you about one of our affiliates, Timeular. That's T-I-M-E-U-L-A-R. Whether you work from home or can go to the office or even to the field, Timeular is an app, and if you want it, a physical device that helps you track your time down to the minute. Have a hard time separating your work-life balance? Set a weekly goal for tracked work hours and stop when you hit that goal. It's right in the app. So support the APN and finally start accurately tracking your time by heading to arcpodnet.com forward slash timeular. That's arcpodnet.com forward slash timeular to get on track today. Hey, fans of archaeology, head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop and click the link to our tea public store. You'll find some awesome designs that you can pick up on t-shirts, mugs, and more. From our Ask an Archaeologist series to the worst idea the Life in Ruins podcast ever had, slamming agriculture. I mean, seriously. Again, that's www.arcpodnet.com forward slash shop for some archaeo swag. Welcome back to a Life in Ruins podcast. This is Dr. Bob Kelly is our guest, and this is segment two. Before we left off talking about Dr. David Hurst Thomas and Dr. Lewis Binford, uh, you may have heard those names uh, several times if you listen to our podcast a lot. Dr. Kelly, if you'd like to kind of just elaborate on the illustriousness that is Lou Binford, if you can. Well, Lou, Lou is, he's a fantastic teacher. He was a fantastic speaker. He, he, he must have learned how to speak from Southern Baptist preachers because that's how he always came off. He was on a mission. Uh, to convert you, <laughs> and, <laughs> and and he learned he learned that 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 cadence and that vocabulary and uh, just how how to speak. The first class I took with him was a, a class on uh, hunter hunter gatherers. This was what he was all about. And the class met once a week, and it started at seven o'clock at night. And we'd we'd go to the seminar room. And Lou would start talking at seven. And sometimes he was still talking at midnight. And the really weird thing was that we were all still there and, and yeah. with him. Midnight pushed it. It pushed it for us. But but that's that's the kind of person he was. He could talk for hours on end and 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 you were still you were still enthralled. You, you were still with him. That, that's sort of the first thing you had to know about Lou is that he, he was he was incredibly char charismatic. One of these people that walked in the room and he had it. It was his. 
without really doing anything. It was just, it was just his, whatever charisma is. And I have no idea. Uh, he, he, he had it. He, he, he looked at things in a, in sort of a different way than I had been trained to think about them. And at the time that I was working with, with him in the, between 1978 and 1980, uh, he was still kind of figuring out the approach that he was going to take. If you look at his publication record, he, he was publishing a bunch in the 1960s. And then in the early 70s, there's a lull, a real dip in, in, in his public publication rate. The, the, you know, David uh, Meltzer has described it as, some people said Lou slowed down. And David Meltzer says, no, Lou was re- reloading is <laughs> what he was doing. And I think he's <laughs> right. Lou was kind of rethinking his position. And he moved away from archaeology as doing a sort of ethnography of the past, more towards archaeology as a way to trace changes in the organization of human societies over over time. And the, the best example of that is his Willow Smoke and Dog's Tail uh, article, where he proposed the ideas of foragers and collectors, of residential mobility and logistical mobility. And the, the real essential difference there is residentially organized hunter-gatherers, foragers, move people to food. And logistically organized hunter-gatherers, co- collectors, what he called collectors, move food to people. And, that, and that, that's a fundamental organizational difference in the need to get people and food together in order to survive. And, and that's what Lou really focused on was how people get organized in these, these different, different ways. And he shifted his interest in archaeology from w- ways to interpret the records so that we could do an ethnography of the past to ways to interpret the record so that we could track changes over time in how human societies were organized, and, and in particular, how hunting and gathering societies were, uh, were organized. And, and this is a, uh, a really fundamental element of loose thinking that I don't think most people appreciate. That's what Lou was all about from the late 1970s on. It was much more about how do we track changes in the organization of societies rather than how do we do prehistoric ethnography, which is what he was really doing, aiming to do in the 1960s. The other, the other thing you might know about Lou is that Lou took no prisoners. <laughs> his, his approach to life was to take no prisoners. I, I went over to his house once for dinner after I would had my PhD and I was <clears throat> driving through Albuquerque when he was still in New Mexico. And Lou invited me out to his house for dinner. And I went out there and he was in his driveway was his car. And his wife, I think it was wife number five, maybe, or, <laughs> si- or, or six, we're not, we're not entirely sure. She was sitting in the car and I went over and said, hi, Nancy, what's, what's, what's going on? And she said, oh, Lou and I have both lost our car, our, our house keys. So he went around back to see if he could find a way in. Well, Lou was a pretty, he was built like a linebacker at the time. He was a, he was a pretty big guy. And I thought, uh, you know, I can slip in through a window. I'm, I'm a skinny guy. I can get in through a window easier than he can. So I went back to help him. I go to the back of the house and here's Lou with a shovel just smashing in the back the back door. He just, he just he de- he demolished the door. And this, this, this was Lou's approach to, to problems. Just smash your way in. Run around and break things. He, that would have been his 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 motto at the, at the time because we study this period in theory as kind of this momentous change in theoretical perspective what was it like to be around it was it was it an interesting experience <laughs> well it, it was an interesting experience because because Lou was so vocal he was uh, prolific 
uh, in his in his writing. He antagonized people. People either loved Lou or they or they hated him. Jimmy Griffin hated him uh, and told me so. At, when when I was there in the late seventies, you know, Lou was having a running debate with Michael Schiffer. Uh, in the in the literature, mostly about the the so-called Pom- Pompeii premise, he was also arguing with uh, Richard Gould and uh, with a variety of other other people. Uh, a lot of the folks at Michigan, he he really did not like some of the people at Michigan, although some of them were his students. Uh, and Lou could be, in my opinion, uh, mean. In in retrospect, I thought he could be mean. I thought he sort of, at times, almost willfully refused to see the other person's point. When the graduate students, you know, would go out on Friday afternoon, we would all go down to a place called Jack's Jack's Bar uh, and sit around and talk about what what he'd been uh, ranting and raving about that that week. We'd often say, you know, we can't really see the difference between what Lou is saying and what Schiffer is saying. They use a different language, but we thought they were much more similar than they were different. And I still feel that way. And I actually wrote I wrote a paper about that when I comparing Lou and 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 Schiffer's work. I, I thought they were much more alike than they were dis, dissimilar. But Lou Lou was um, somebody who was that's that's the way he approached things. Was he was going to argue with you? <laughs> And he and he could he could get sometimes a little personal and and nasty about it. And I that's that's not who I ever wanted to be. I I I think I didn't pick that up from from him. I don't think so. I hope not. But uh, but I'll but I'll also say that Lou once told told me uh, only argue with people if you think you're going to learn something from the argument. Don't waste your time arguing with other other people. So he he argued with Schiffer, and with Gould, uh, with with John John Yellen. So he must have thought there was something productive to to get out of that. Otherwise, he he wouldn't have bothered to argue with them. That's actually a really good lesson. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. really profound. Yeah, it is. I didn't know the the finer details of Lou. I heard some things from Dave Anderson here and there, but it's definitely. Like for people Connor Carlton's age and my age, like archaeology is kind of based off of his ideas at this point. Like we all have this scientific approach and like view the world through that kind of lens. And that's obviously what led us to Wyoming and working with you. So it's just really interesting how one person kind of had that impact, you know? He, he did have an enormous uh, impact. He, he educated a bunch of, of people. Uh, lots of people read him. He was required reading and in plenty of, of courses. I don't know how much people read him today. There's at least one and possibly two of his papers, last time I looked, were in the top 10 most cited papers published in uh, American and Antiquity. Of course, his archaeology, his anthropology paper, and the Willow Smoke and Dog's, Dog's Tales, two of the most cited papers in uh, in archaeology, so he, he had an enormous uh, effect on the on the field. I, I think he his his last book, the uh, constructing frames of of reference book, is unfortunate. It's almost un, un unreadable. His his writing was never very very good. It was pretty turgid. His speaking was brilliant. His writing was was not. And by the time he wrote that book, no one was willing to pull the reins in on him. So it's it's way too long. And in the book, Lou always argued against the perspective of human behavioral ecology. And none of his students have ever understood this because his work is, in fact, nothing but human behavioral ecology. It doesn't use the language or the models, but it it fits entirely within that that field, and yet Lou specifically rejected it. He, he he told me to my 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 face. He said, "I I don't know why you would you would use that. It makes no sense." And I I I could never understand why he thought it made no sense. Hmm. Uh, and I I just don't understand that. 
and uh, you know, I guess we'll never, we'll never know. We're super fortunate that he, he did not inherit his method for promoting his ideas, but also that you did, you know, kind of work. You you did take something away from him in this kind of theoretical perspective, and kind of shifting towards that. What in general does you know anthropology mean to you? And you, I mean, you've you've been. A, You've been a part of archaeology and anthropology for a long time. What does it What does it mean to you? Well, it's it means everything. <laughs> it means everything to me. It's it covers it covers everything. <laughs> you know, it, it it covers humans as cultural organisms. It it covers humans as biological organisms. It covers the present. It covers the past. It, it entails psychology. It entails uh, art. It entails language. It it, it there's absolutely nothing. That is not of interest to anthropology, and I, I suppose that's that, that's what's kept me in the field, and what keeps it fresh is there's always something new to go and and look at. I, I also think it's it's absolutely crucial to the you know I don't want to sound Pollyannish, but but to making the world a better place. I mean it's it's all about the differences among people and why there are those differences. And the central message of anthropology is that, you know, it's okay if there, if there are different differences. It's okay. And this to me is, at this moment in time, look around the world. We absolutely need this perspective and that, and that approach and that, and that attitude. So what does anthropology mean to me? I'm, my goodness, I think it's it's, it could be the salvation of the world. That's all. <laughs> it's, it's extremely important because it helps us understand why there are, are differences. And once you start asking the question, why are there differences? You know, you don't have to accept those, those differences as good and, and right, but you do have to understand what it is that people are really doing and what they're really thinking about. And that's that's really where anthropology comes comes in, understanding why people do what what they do. This is incredibly important to knowing what it means to be to be human. And being human doesn't mean being just like y- you and me. It can mean a whole range of of things. There's a whole range of behaviors that are should be completely tolerable and acceptable as be, being human. Different ways of worshiping, uh, d- different ways of, uh, of sexuality, uh, um, different ways of organizing your relatives, <laughs> different, different kinds of foods. It, it's, it's all, all of this is valid human behavior. Yeah. I think, I think, um, you know, once you kind of view life and humans, through that lens of, you know, human behaviors, difference, you know, diversity and all these things, it's really hard. It, it just, once you take that view, it's really hard to, um, I think, be, be hateful for people who do things differently. You know, I think it, it really has changed and it, it hurts my brain when, when I'm trying to process it, but how you th- think about the world and it, it can be, like you said, used for such good nowadays. And, and it, it'll make you a much happier person because you don't spend all the time sitting in your house going, oh, I can't, I can't stand those Somali Muslims down the street. I don't, I don't know why they're here. And, 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 and instead, if you just go, huh, those are different people. They speak a different language. They have different customs. They have a different religion. That's kind of interesting. That's kind of curious. Maybe I'll just go find out about it. You don't have to accept it. Nothing says you have to accept it. But you'll be a much happier person if you just go, you know, it's it's all right. They're, they're not bothering me. So I'll just let them, you know, it's just live and let let live. And anthropology really helps you, I think, develop that attitude that um, other other ways of being are kind of curious and interesting and perhaps there's something you can learn from it. It's a hard thing to teach people, especially once they're older. Very, very hard to teach people that. 
Yeah. And just to piggyback off that, you know, when I I was an undergraduate in Radford University, I went to a wedding um, that it was uh, my partner at the time. Her cousin was getting married to uh, a man from Cameroon. Very devout uh, evangelical family marrying, you know, a a person from the Cameroon. And uh, her family, who was the evangelical Floridians, hated the wedding hated the dress, hated the food. And she was wearing, the bride was wearing this beautiful seafoam green dress with all these shells. It was made in the Cameroon and mm-hmm. no one could understand why they wouldn't have a quote unquote traditional wedding. And I was like, this is amazing that they had a traditional Cameroon wedding and that they'd showed us this extreme difference in how a wedding ceremony can be done. And the food was absolutely phenomenal. But like from an anthropologist point, I was just fascinated with the wedding. And like, I, and I always think like, what if I hadn't been an anthropologist? What if I had continued a uh, degree path in, in history? Would I have been able to respect and, and, and cherish that, that wedding as I did as an anthropologist? And I, and I don't think I would have because our training, even as undergrads is how do you try to be as unbiased as possible? And how do you give everyone the equal footing and, and respect all cultural cultures as equal to your own? It's definitely difficult for me to like separate it as like a, a, a study of like, you know, science from just like kind of like a way of life sometimes. Cause it's just, it's just part of who I am, I guess at this point, you know, I, I think it's probably the same for you guys. That's why we're doing this. I think it's cool. I like anthropology a lot. <laughs> and on that, and on that profound statement, I think we're going to end this segment. Um, so we'll catch you uh, on the next segment. Hey, archaeology fans, Chris Webster here. That last ad and this one were just heard by over 4,000 fans of archaeology and history. Do you have something you'd like to sell them? From job postings to products and services, podcast advertising works. Through our unique hosting service, we can play your ad for a short window of time so your customers aren't hearing something that's old two years from now. We can also make your advertising budget go further because we charge by the download, not by the episode. So if you want 10,000 people to hear your ad, that's what you're going to get. Our system allows us to target countries and zip codes so you get exactly the audience you desire. If you'd like to hear more, contact our advertising manager, Madison, at advertising at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. She's super cool and waiting for your call with a media kit and some sweet, sweet metrics. So that's Madison at advertising at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Remember, podcast advertising works because you're listening to this literally right now. And thanks for not skipping. The Archaeology Podcast Network is now available on the educational podcast app Lyceum. Spelled L-Y-C-E-U-M, you can find it on your phone's app store. The APN joins other educational shows like Radiolab, Science Versus, and 99% Invisible. Do you want to learn something? Then the Lyceum app is for you. It's free to download and free to listen. Oh, and you can chat with the hosts right in the app. That's right. Podcast listening isn't a one-way street anymore, folks. So check out Lyceum on your phone's app store or over at www.lyceum.fm. That's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M. Learn something today. Chris Webster here. Did you know that I edit most of the podcasts on the Archaeology Podcast Network? I've been doing this since about 2012 when we started the CRM Archaeology Podcast. In 2017, I solidified my audio education by completing a certification course at the Podcast Engineering School. Now I train people in podcasting and produce and edit podcasts for others. Head over to Chris Webster Productions at propodcastnow.com. If you've always wanted to have a podcast for yourself or your business, now's the time. I'll show you how to do it or do some or all of it for you. You can also take my self-guided online course. Whatever your podcast production needs are, I can help out at propodcastnow.com. And we're back with segment three of the Life Rumors podcast. We have the privilege and the honor of being here with Dr. Robert L. Kelly. And uh, so we just kind of talked about what anthropology meant to Dr. Kelly and, and shared some personal experiences with how being an anthropologist has, has changed us and our perceptions of our environment. Um, but I mean, just like fundamentally, we've never really asked, we've never ans- asked this question before, but uh, Dr. Kelly, what is it, what does it mean to be human? Huh? What does it mean to be human? Well, I, I suppose it could mean a lot of things, but what, what really makes humans unique in the world of animals is is culture and there there are some out there who would who would debate that they would they would argue you know that there are other primates 
uh, that have culture, orangutans, chimps, uh, bonobos. I, I don't think any of that is is correct. And I think it, if you have a very simplistic uh, notion of what culture is, then you, yeah, you could you could argue that um, ravens and crows have have culture. But what what culture is is it's a it's a particular understanding of the of the world. It's a view of the world about how the world is supposed to operate, about what one's supposed to do in life, about what men and women are supposed to do, about what 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 the afterlife is, and what you're supposed to do in this life in order to do whatever uh, achieve whatever is supposed to happen uh, after you you die. It's 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 got this this idea in your head about what life is and we aren't born with that idea we we acquire it we're enculturated we're socialized into that uh, idea but there's constantly an idea there about what life is supposed to be like and for h- humans this this really sets up a, a problem because what life is supposed to be like is never what life is actually is. There's always a disconnect between life as we live it and life as we expect it to be lived. So we expect life to be pleasant and interesting and fun and free of violence. That's not our everyday experience. It doesn't meet that. So there's this constant disconnect between life as it is and life as we expect it to be, as our culture teaches us it's supposed to be. And this is this is what creates trouble between people, between people of, of different cultures. When you encounter someone from another culture that clearly is not going to act in the way that you think they're supposed to act. There's a, a, a serious disconnect there. And that's where the whole field of cultural misunderstandings comes comes in. The, the interesting thing about, about culture is that once humans had it, and I, I suspect they had it about 200,000 year, years ago, that disconnect between what life is supposed to be like and the life as, as a lived experience is going to constantly drive you to try and make life as it's lived into life as it is supposed to be. And that, I think, is what drove human adaptation for, well, up until the present, the present day. We're still trying to deal with this disconnect between life as we think it's supposed to be and life as it's actually lived. It's one of the things that propels human societies to constantly change. Because we're always trying to solve this disconnect between these these two. And I think that disconnect, the evidence for that disconnect, to bring it back to archaeology, the evidence for that disconnect lies in art and symbolic expression. And I actually have a project right now where I'm trying to figure out when the earliest symbolic expressions arose and did they arise quickly, or was it a very slow change over time? And uh, we don't have the answer to that yet, but it's it's the project I've been working on when I've been in uh, Europe, at, in Germany, and in England. So look look for that in another year or so after we've analyzed all the all the all the data. But but this is really what it what it means to be human is to have this this idea of how life is supposed to live. And to recognize that it's not the way that we're actually living, and then trying to deal with that fact. That's what being human is all about. So it's like we have um, culture is this model of the way things work. And we're always trying to fit life around us into that model. And like you said, if we don't, if it doesn't, we ultimately try to change that. And it, a model is always you know, is the ideal interaction or the ideal um, situation for something. And sometimes models fall short of what reality is in you. Yeah. And, and, and it always does. It, it always does. We just, we can't, 
We can't ever have the world fit exactly the way we think it's supposed to work, especially in a world where we have cultural diversity. <laughs> there are there are people out there walking around with different ideas about how the world is supposed to work. And and now they've they've not only got to deal with the fact themselves that their life doesn't match the way it's supposed to be, but the way other people are think life is supposed to be is not the way that you think life is supposed to be. It's a real dilemma. And the great challenge we have before us is to figure out how we're going to deal with that. And that's uh, my, my book, The Fifth Beginning, is, is partly about that, about the, the, the next big transition in human society is, uh, has to confront that fact and has to, has to decide how it's going to, how it's going to deal, deal with it. For some people, it's it's going to mean, well, let's just get rid of everything that doesn't make sense to me, but that'll never happen. Something new will arise. So, you know, just kind of like, you know, taking that further and these complex ideas of, you know, how people perceive their surroundings and their environment through their lens of culture, you know, how do we study this, this human behavior in the past or you know, how do we, how do we try to, because a lot of these ideas are just, are just abstract. So how do we, as archeologists take this to the next level and trying to study, study these interactions between people, their environment and how they perceive the world? Understanding how people understood the world is, is extraordinarily difficult from archeological data and extraordinarily difficult for you know, very ancient reaches of, of time. If you want to go back 20,000 years, 100,000 years, th- that's very difficult to uh, get at. And I'm, and I'm not sure that we ever actually can get, get to it. We, we might be able to come up with some good ideas, plausible ones, but how we go about testing them, I, I don't really know how, how to do that. Ontology uh, doesn't really like fossilize. Yeah. No, no, it it doesn't. And and you can get the same the same artifacts that have very different meanings to to people. I mean, the, the same object can have very different meanings to to people, and it, and they can change over over time. So it's very hard for us to get to that from from prehistoric data. One of the things we might be able to study, though, is now, if, if we can't get to the actual specific abstract ideas, we can get to l- look at periods of time when the discussion and communication of those abstract ideas takes on greater importance. And this, this really comes back to Lou's idea of looking at the, the organization of things. You can't, we can't really look at specific ideas, but we can look at how important was it for people to talk about ideas. And, and that's when you see, I, I think, in my opinion, is when you see real spikes in the production of things like art, art objects, because the purpose of art really is to talk about the disconnect between life as we think it should be and life as it, as it is. Ooh. The, the 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 example I always give is the art of uh, Norman Rock, Rockwell, who used to paint the covers of Sat- Saturday Evening Evening Post, and he's famous for painting these pictures that are all these very placid white bread, white middle class scenes of life where everything is really wonderful and pleasant and there, there, there's lots of them the policeman sitting at a lunch counter with a little boy who's clearly running away from home and the the cop is just sitting there and it's very clear the cop is going to have a conversation with the boy and and convince him that he should go home it's a very wonderful view of of policemen especially in in today's world and, and with, then when you look at Norman Rockwell's life, you would think he lived this life, right? He was not painting scenes from his life. He was not. His life was miserable. It was full of rejection. 
he was never accepted as a real artist by the art communities. He could never have a showing of his art. He was a, a, a mere illustrator, not an artist. He went through several marriages. There was uh, institutionalization in, in there. He, he, he did not live a very happy life. He was painting pictures of life as it's supposed to be, not the life that he was, he was living. My favorite artist is uh, Edward Hopper. And if you look at Edward Hopper's paintings, it's nothing but loneliness. His famous painting of the, the, the diner in New York City where there's several people sitting there, it's obviously late at night, maybe the early morning hours. Nobody's talking to each other. Several people all alone. They're with people, but they're lonely. And this is, this is what Hopper talked about. And the, Hopper's painting this in New York City, a city of several million people at the time. This is in about 1941, I, I believe. This is his uh, Nighthawks painting. And you're wondering, how could you be lonely in a city of millions of people? And he's wondering about this disconnect between life should be connection with people, but it's often not connection with people. And he's, his art is trying to grapple with that, that disconnect. And that's what art always does. So we could look at it prehistorically and look at when is art being produced? And it's telling us the, the mere fact that there's art being produced tells us something about the, the stresses that, that people felt they were living under. So look at Clovis. How much art is associated with Clovis? I guess we can have their, you know, the the prettiness of their points and maybe ochre, and that's about it. There's that. That's like it. There's like no rock art. There's some very simple inscribed stones down at the Galt site. Maybe their points are what they considered art. There's uh, ochre that's involved in some of those caches, which I suspect are primarily burials. But there's they didn't feel compelled apparently to produce a lot of art objects. They weren't carving stuff in ivory. We, we would have found it. We found their bone rods. So, so some of that stuff could have been there. They didn't feel compelled to produce a lot of art. My guess is that the, the lives of Clovis folks was going pretty much the way that they felt life was supposed to be going. There was much less of a disconnect between the life that they thought they should be living and the life that they were actually living. That's my interpretation. I don't know if it's if it's if it's right, but that's one way that I think we can study the, the ideology in the past. Look at periodicities in the production of symbolic things, rock art, carvings, whether pottery is decorated or not. Uh, maybe whether stone tools are made fancier than they have to be or not. But I but I think that's the most productive way to look at the abstract culture of, of prehistory. It, it changes more when you get more of a production of art and you can start looking at how are men portrayed, how are women port portrayed. You, you can start talking a, a lot more about that. What sorts of things do people, do people paint? But it gets more difficult to do in the more ancient reaches of, of time. And I know you had mentioned a couple of these. What other mo modes of artistic expression are, have you been studying for this, this project that you've been in, in Germany for? The, the Paleolithic art project is looking at the objects of symbolic expression, which I sort of gloss over as art, from about 40,000 years on back. The oldest objects that I've put in the database and that I accept as as some kind of object of symbolic expression is a, about 140,000 years years old. There may be some older stuff. There are some objects out there that are older than that, but we can we can't date them very well. And for this project, we're asking the question to what extent does taphonomic bias structure the archaeological record of objects of symbolic expression. And the reason we're looking at taphonomy is because most of these art objects are done in organic medium. It's an antler or bone or ivory or shell. So we're using a taphonomic model to try and correct 
what the record looks like to see what it actually looks like if we took away the nasty destructive forces of the of the of the record so we're looking at m mostly portable objects all, all the rock art the painted rock art tends to show up it's younger than 40,000 years ago and we we, we put the cutoff at 40,000 years in part because after 40,000 years ago there's no question about it um, humans are cultural beings and that's that's really what i'm trying to ask is at what point did humans become cultural beings because art is going to sim symbolize that is going to tell us when that happened have you ever had the chance to to really study the el castillo caves in uh, is it spain or france spain right el castillo uh, th 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 those are in spain I've I've never studied those those caves. That's a that's a whole that's a lifetime uh, of, of preparation there. I, I've been in Lascaux. That, that cave was closed to the public many years ago, uh, but I was there in the early two thousands when they were letting a few people in each week, and, and you kind of had to ask you had to ask permission to uh, get into it and. I had some friends in France who pulled some strings for me, <laughs> and and I, and I was able to go in Las Lasco. Where, did you see any evidence of giraffes or uh, Asian elephants in either of those caves? <laughs> we have it on good authority from a uh, individual in Oregon who sells uh, uh, solar panels that he swears that there are these African and Asian megafauna represented in these caves. No, that's that's not correct. <laughs> <laughs> There is a surprising lack of canids in the uh, Paleolithic art of France and Spain, though, which is kind of interesting. Well, a surprising lack of canids. There's also a surprising lack of people. There's that, too. They did not draw people. And when they drew people, <laughs> it's kind of pathetic. I mean, it, it was it, it literally is something I could draw, and I have no art, artistic <laughs> ability whatsoever. So that that's kind of curious. I don't think we really know the answer. That, Do you think it's because we didn't want people and dogs like interacting with the, you know, the hunting animals or something like that? Or I, I have no idea. Hmm. I have no idea. I, I honestly have no good explanation for that one. Interesting. Well, I guess now that I've stumped Bob Kelly, let's go to the next section. <laughs> <laughs> And welcome back to Life in Ruins for another special episode where we're doing four segments instead of three. We're here with uh, Dr. Bob Kelly from the University of Wyoming. So this episode has gone extremely well and something that we wanted to touch upon since, since Dr. Kelly, you've been in the field some from very pivotal moments. One, starting a career at Gatecliff, but also being witness to that transition that Dr. Lou Benford brought in from really moving towards that cultural historical approach to making archaeology a science and ground and grounded in the scientific method and you've seen the post-processual some would say revolution others would say rebellion <laughs> <laughs> and so you've you've been around for some pretty pivotal moments of our field and so we just kind of wanted to ask you in in general you know how is the, how has the field changed since you first began being a professional archaeologist back in the 70s well Okay, yeah. So, so my experience goes back to 1973, and the, the the field has changed a great deal in a number of different ways, and and for and for different different reasons. How has it changed? Well, I'd first of all point out that its its composition has really changed. That back in 1973, if you went to an SAA meeting, most of the people there would be Caucasian. Most of them would be male, not not all, but most of them would would be male, and you would see very few uh, people of color, virtually no uh, Native Americans. Which, I, I, you know, back back then I was a teenager, I didn't give it a, another thought. But it, when you think about it, that's really weird. So it, the 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 nature of the field was in part a function of. The sociology of the field, the, the fact that it was dominated by Europeans and, and by white males. What what else can I say? Th that's certainly changed over the over the years. The um, the SEA's membership is fifty percent female now. 
We have a, a Choctaw who's currently the president of the of the organization. There's many more uh, Native American and uh, African Americans who are are at the at the meetings. It's become much more diverse and pluralistic, and that's only been a good thing. It has produced some some tensions, but overall, it's a very good thing. Back in the 70s, when we would go into the town of Fallon, Nevada, Dave Thomas told us that we may not go to the Sagebrush Bar. And okay, why is that? Why can't we go there? He said, well, that's that's where the Paiute go. And if you go there, you're going to start talking with them and it'll cause trouble and we don't want trouble. So you can't go to that, to that bar. So, oh, okay. Yeah, I was, I was young. Dave, by the way, Today would never say that. Today, the individuals like him have have changed in, enormously. When we ran the excavation at Hidden Cave, which was outside Fallon, Nevada, this is back in '79, the, we ran public tours through the through the site. And there's a community there, the Paiute Shoshone com- community, uh, right, right outside Fallon. And they, as members of the public, they were certainly welcome to come on the tours, but we didn't specifically reach out to that community. That that was, looking back on it, I just go, how the heck could we have done that? How the, could we have missed that? Why? It's, it's just kind of baffling. And, and we would do it completely different today. The project would have been done completely different. We would have been working with that community, talking with them about how how do they want this work done? Because it's a very public project, and it, it, it was a great project. I mean, the site's now uh, set up for public visitation, and there's a a, a display in the local uh, Fallon County Museum. You know, in, in many ways, it was a it was a great community outreach project. But we didn't reach out specifically to the tribes, and I know David today. He has he's said it publicly that that. That was wrong. And if they did it today, we would have done it completely differently. And and that's true for many uh, archaeologists. The whole idea of working with the community, of a community-based archaeology, is becoming much, much more prevalent. Uh, And many archaeologists are finding this quite satisfying, quite satisfying to be working with tribes rather than arguing with them about things like NAGPRA and burials and and so on. It's it's much more fun to work with people than against them. And it's and it's much more interesting and and productive. So that's 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 been a huge change in the field and a, and a change in what it is we want to know about the the past. And and f- there is some tension there because s- some of us look at archaeology and we want to study it scientifically and we want to understand what makes populations grow and decline or how why do people change their subsistence broaden their diets invent agriculture and so those are all sort of scientific questions and what the local communities really want to know is the their their own history the, the answers to their to their particular historical questions what happened in the past? What did my ancestors do? What was life like for them? In some ways, it's going back to the archaeology that Binford eventually rejected of doing prehistoric ethnography. And in my own career, I've, I've, I'm trying to, to do this. I'm actually trying to keep a foot in both, both worlds here, which, which is not easy to do because they're both very, both a both a scientific and a more hum- humanistic tasks are, are just very time consuming. But I'm now working on another book, sort of a follow up to the fifth beginning, another short, short book. I don't really have a title for it yet, but it's a 15,000 year history of the United States. And my goal is to give a history of the United States starting 15,000 years ago and actually coming up to the, the present day. And I've been working on it this summer, and I've realized this is this is a much 
it's a much bigger task than I had than I had imagined it 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 would would be. But it's partly to satisfy that that desire to uh, to not be a scientist, but to be a a human humanist and present a a readable history of of this chunk of real estate that today is the is the United States. I'm assuming the sixth beginning was already taken. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, everyone asks me about the sixth beginning, and and I always tell them, look. You know, let's let's get through the fifth beginning first, and then <laughs> and then we'll worry about the sixth beginning. So, so the field has changed enormously in that in that way. Its composition has changed, and some of its 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 goals have changed, partly as a result of the change in the comp- composition. There, there, there's another way that it's it's changed. Back in the late 70s and early 80s, there was a bumper sticker that showed up on some archaeologist vehicles that that, uh, read, archaeologists are the cowboys of science. And and at the time, it was sort of true. We claimed to be a science, but we weren't a very good science. We were sort of science done by by cow cowboys. (laughs) It it was just it was a bit of the wild, wild west. We claim to be scientists because oh we have you know we have a radiocarbon date so that that makes us sci- scientists. We went through a whole long debate in the seventies, especially the nineteen seventies, over what is science and what's a hypothesis and what's hypothesis testing. And let me tell you, this got really really boring. There were so many papers written about them. Binford wrote, wrote some of them. Uh, there's the famous book by Watson, LeBlanc, and, and Redmond that was all about making archaeology into a, a science that was published in the early 70s. We got it down into deeply into the weeds of the philosophy of, of science and, and Hempel and Popper and, and whether the hypothetical deductive method was the model we wanted to use. And it just, oh my God, it, it, it just got really dull. The, the end result, though, was that archaeology has indeed turned into a much, much stronger science, a much stronger science. We understand how to do statistics much, much better. We understand the limitations of the field. We understand the nature of the data that we're, we're working with. And we're able to do work in a, in a truly more scientific fashion without worrying about all the philosophy of, of, of science. We're, we're able to do much, much better work. Big data has, has helped in this, in this regard because we can compile lots and lots of archaeological data as we're doing in our current uh, radiocarbon project where we're building a database of uh, uh, North American radiocarbon dates. Uh, And we're able to do things much, much better than we did them in the 1970s. As part of this radiocarbon project, I've had to go back and look at Look at reports from the 1960s and 1970s, and I, I read these, and sometimes I say to myself, "Oh my God, this, this is this is pathetic. It's a, it's sort of we're a bunch of kids playing at being sci- scientists." I don't think that's that's true today, though. So how do we how do we take kind of like what we've learned as as modern archaeologists, you know, building upon the theories and the methods of the past, and how do we make archaeology more more prominent in, in contemporary political discourse. Oh, in contemporary political discourse, I'm I'm not sure how to do that. I don't think Donald Trump would have the slightest bit of interest in um, listening to archaeologists <laughs> talk talk to him. <laughs> You know, there's not enough money in our field to, to put us on on his uh, radar, and we too often stand in the way of of projects. And of course, you know, he's now he signed a, an executive order a few weeks ago that basically guts the National Historic Preser- Preservation Act. If, if uh, an agency wants to uh, ignore it, they can. This is shocking because it does it to the Environmental Protection Act uh, as as well. So how do you bring it into the political dis- discourse? Well, I, 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 I think it has to be done through public education. 
uh, through podcasts like like this, although ones you know aimed even more at the at the public, through doing writing for the public, through museum dis- displays, through public displays at at sites along ro- roadways. This is where it it really has to be done, and it has to be done in the right way in in a in a way that speaks to the the public. And I found this to be true with the fifth beginning. I had people send me emails from all over the country. <laughs> people called me up and not archaeologists. These are just, you know, regular folks who were um, really thankful to read something that was a little optimistic at the end, or at least left the door open for an optimistic uh, next chapter in, in humanity's uh, history. It, it touched a nerve for some, for some, for some people, and I'm, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was happy about that, and and that we could all do more of that, and in academia, the that kind of work is not, not always really valued, and it it really it really should should be, and in general. I, the way I've always uh, been explained to me is that academia is it's about bean counting. It's about producing articles for prestigious journals or there's all these kind of metrics that you have to keep up with. And, you know, th- th- normally that part doesn't contain this public engagement kind of thing. You're not that's not what your goal is. Your goal is to, you know, bring the the, the university better or you know, that stuff like that. It's just, it just isn't in the culture at this point. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, I, I can do it at this point in my career because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm closing in on retirement. I, I don't really care what, <laughs> what, what anybody has to say or, or, or thinks. I mean, you, you, you do reach a certain point in your career where you can, you can, you can do this and it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I, I don't think I would have done it as when I was trying to get tenure or when I was trying to get promotion to full. It, it sort of had to wait, but it also had to wait because I, you know, I just didn't know enough to write something like that. I, I, I just didn't know enough. I, I couldn't, I, I'm finding it hard to write this, this book about North American uh, pre, prehistory, even after studying it since, <laughs> since I was 16 years old, it's, it's still really hard hard to do. It's a vast subject and it only gets more, more vaster uh, every, every day. It's not the sort of thing you can do necessarily really early in your, in your career. Bob, it really makes me happy to hear that, you know, in one of the breaks, you know, we talked about what SciComm was and how, and what you just said that some of this public outreach should be, you know, more valued and, you know, here at Boulder, we, um, the grad students, we all get, we have year reviews where, you know, the department gets together and basically tells each grad student how they're doing. And I remember, you know, we started this podcast back in March of last year, right before my review. And in my review, it said, don't let this podcast be a distraction and you have other things to do. You need to publish. And this, in this past year, you know, since this year has, has happened, I've gotten a, a job, you know, field, field work was canceled. So the field school Boulder runs was canceled. So I couldn't go out back to Lynch with Dr. Bamforth and Dr. Carlson. And I got a job with the museum here to start a podcast with the museum. And uh, I have a TED talk coming up and it's all a result of doing this kind of public engagement. You know, this, this, this podcast itself is, is geared towards undergrads in anthropology or people who like archaeology. We're not a, a podcast that gets really into the nitty gritty about method or theory. It's to have a fun time, you know, with, with David and Connor and myself and, and people we bring on to really educate and engage the public, which is cool things that are going on in our field. And it's been something that as, as the three of us have become more engaged, especially, you know, David with an Instagram account of all things, the way to articulate it is like, David on a, on a weekly basis is to over 20,000 people introducing concepts and ideas through artwork and, and quick posts of 250 words on concepts and anthropology. And people are reaching out to him and they're reaching out to us about 
how we've got a couple emails now about how we inspired people to get into the field. And, and yet we still get people, or in my case, professors wondering why I'm not publishing. And, and to me, I, I kind of struggle with, you know, we do a podcast and we get each episode now, I think it's over a thousand downloads per episode upon the first month. And, and it's hard for me to, to look at a publication. If I do a publication on radiocarbon dating on, on Plains Chronology and the late prehistoric, how many people will end up citing it? Like maybe a hundred and that's if I'm lucky and how many people will read it versus how many people am I reaching with the podcast episode? And if we do an Instagram post, how many people are going to read that and be sparked into anthropology? And it's become a really hard or not hard, but a difficult thing to weigh in my professional career is what's more important. Is it, is it the number of articles I produce or is it, the amount of people I can reach through anthropological content. Every student has to make the decision for themselves. What what are they going to be all all about? And it, it part part of that is is asking yourself what 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 are my own personal strengths and being honest about that. And the and the other is, you know, what would I like to see carved on my tombstone? And do you want to see carved on your tombstone? I published. 10 articles in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that were that were well regarded by my peers, all, all 10 of them. Or you want to say, I, I inspired a bunch of, uh, of Pawnee kids to go on to the university and get involved in their community and become historians or physicists or doctors or it's, you, you have to decide what you know, what, what, what are you good at? And yeah, what do you want on your tombstone? Well, and on, on that note, we've, we want to thank you, Bob, for many things for, you know, gracing our podcast today. We want to thank you for teaching us and being patient with us as we went through the master's uh, process. Um, <laughs> and we also want to thank you uh, for signing the, that we graduated as part of that as well. <laughs> well, uh, well. Well, you're all most most welcome. And I'm I'm utterly delighted to see the 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 three of you working together on this uh, on this 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 venture. I I wish you all the luck in the world. Well thank you, Bob. I appreciate it, Bob. Thank you, Bob. So Dr. Kelly, this podcast is called A Life in Ruins, and we always ask our guests at the end if they would choose to do this over, like if they had another chance at life, would you choose to live a life in ruins? Well, the only thing I'm really good at is digging holes in the ground. So um, (laughs) if I'm not going to be a ditch digger, then uh, yeah, yeah, I'll take a life in ruins. I think that's the most honest answer we've got. (laughs) Yeah. And on that note, uh, we are going to end the show, episode 27 with Dr. Robert L. Kelly from the University of Wyoming. Um, And we will see you Next time this thing comes out. Thanks for listening to a Life in Ruins podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at a Life in Ruins podcast. And you can also email us at a Life in Ruins podcast at gmail.com. And remember, make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer. Guys, what is one of the best archaeology mottos out there? And, you know, how do you keep keep yourself going? Make sure your line level is straight. Use a square trowel. <laughs> no, you just never throw in the trowel. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was painful. I'm sorry. <laughs> This show is produced by the Archaeology Podcast Network, Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle in Reno, Nevada at the Reno Collective. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.
Chris Webster here. Thanks for listening and sharing this episode across your socials. It really helps us get the word out. If you don't know how to share from your podcast app, just look for a share icon on Apple devices. It's usually a box with a little arrow coming out of it, something like that, and share it across your socials right from in the app. If you'd like to support us a little more and get some extras in the process, then head over to arcpodnet.com slash members for some options. That's arcpodnet.com slash members to support archaeological education and outreach. 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 Education